All right. Hello, all. Uh, welcome to Categories, Modalities, and Type Theories. Oh, my. So this is going to be a talk about the interplay between category theory on one hand and modalities on the other. And there's lots of interesting connections here, but we're going to focus on some of the, the slightly more attainable ones, <coughs> which is how can we use categories to talk about modal logic by providing some kind of natural semantics? And conversely, how can we use modal logic to talk about categories by providing some natural syntax? And I'll be assuming some basic category theoretic knowledge throughout. Um, I'll try to keep it as approachable as possible. If you've heard the word pre-sheaf, you're probably good. And I think everyone in this room should, should certainly be good. Um, and officially, I'm not assuming any, logic, any uh, modal logic knowledge, but I, I'm definitely going to be, every definition is going to be presented as though you've seen it before. But all the relevant definitions will be here. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. So recall basic propositional modal logic allows for all the propositional comforts that you love. We have variables, we have all the standard logical connectives, and we add some bonus connectives called modalities where we have box and diamond. Now, the basic part of the name is because we're only adding one pair of modalities, but if we wanted to be extra fancy, we could add an entire family. You see this all the time if you're doing some sort of epistemic logic, you add if you want to know not only what Alice thinks, but also what Bob thinks, you have modalities for each of them. Or if you want to model programming languages, for instance, you might have a different modality for each program you want to execute. Um, but for simplicity's sake, let, let's keep it to, to one symbol. And I, I think it should be uh, relatively clear to those experienced with the material, how it generalizes to more modalities. So uh, the interpretation of these symbols varies, but it's, whoops, Traditional to introduce them as reading box fee as saying that fee is necessary, which apparently I can't spell, and diamond fee as saying that fee is possible. Uh, but there's other interpretations, which I think are worth mentioning. So you can also use box and diamonds to talk about knowledge, which is the thing that I alluded to earlier. Uh, there's also henceforth, if you think about uh, some sort of uh, we're going to talk later about uh, pre sheaves and this topos as being sets varying with time. And so in this context, um, box is going to tell us that once phi is true, phi, phi sort of remains true for all time after that point. Um, and diamond phi then, the interpretation is going to be that phi is true eventually, but maybe doesn't stay true, um, which is a useful thing to reason about. Uh, there's also this proof theoretic interpretation of box, uh, which tells us something about provability in some meta theory. And the interesting thing about modalities and sort of why we as mathematicians might care about modalities is that the truth of box phi depends on phi itself. Uh, normally, uh, the, the connectives we're allowed to use, the, the truth value of the connective depends only on the truth value of phi, right? So like not doesn't care what phi is, not only cares if phi is true or false, whereas whether or not phi is provable depends on phi itself. Um, okay. So modalities are useful because they aren't truth functional. And that gives us some bonus expressivity in our logic. Okay, so I've talked sort of at a high level about what these things are, but let's spend a little bit more time talking about what they do. So the first like really important thing to keep in mind is we have some notion of duality, which is gonna come back to haunt us later, where diamond is not box not. Um, this is exactly the, this is entirely analogous to De Morgan's laws, for instance. And in fact, constructively, just like De Morgan's laws fail, duality is going to fail here when we when we move to a uh, uh, intuitionistic system. We also have this uh, what's called axiom K, uh, almost certainly for Kripke, not to be confused with axiom K in homotopy type theory, which tells us that box distributes over uh, implication. You can think about this morally as a kind of functoriality, um, and we're going to see that later as well. We also have necessitation, which tells us that if I can prove phi sort of in, in some amount of generality, then I'm allowed to conclude box phi in my proof system. Um, and again, if you think about the interpretation of box phi as phi being necessary, then if I can prove phi, then it's true everywhere. So it must be necessary. Okay. And we can also add bonus axioms to indicate certain features that we want any given modality to possess. And so, for instance, we have axiom T, which I'm going to write it both in terms of box and in terms of diamond, because uh, I guess this is, well, this is going to come back to, yeah, this is going to come back later as well. Uh, we also have axiom 4, and S4 is an abbreviation for T plus 4. 
there's a really, really tight connection between these axioms and certain classes of frames, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But unfortunately, we're not going to have time to talk about that connection. Um, but anyone who's seen some modal logic will know about it. And it's definitely something to ask after the talk if you haven't seen it before, because it's really, really cool. OK, so we have this notion of uh, syntax. We know what our formulas do, and we have some interpretation in mind. How do we actually go about formalizing the semantics of this thing? Well, I said the word frame earlier. What is that? A frame is a set W equipped with some binary relation. And you can think about this as a directed graph where I have vertices for every world in W. And my binary relation gives me some directed edges going from world to world. And then a model is a frame equipped with valuation function. Um, we're going to write uh, the valuation function as Scott brackets. And the dream is going to be once we know how to define uh, my valuation on my primitive propositions, we're then going to extend that to all formulas by some recursive definition. So like I said earlier, W is a set of possible worlds. And W being in, uh, I guess, Scott bracket P says that P is true at W. Um, and then, like I said, we want to extend this interpretation to all formulas. But before we do that, let's spend a little bit of time on intuition. Here is a sample frame um, taken from a really excellent website called like the modal logic playground or something like that, which is uh, kind of fun. So the arrows tell us how the possible worlds are related. So world zero sees world two. World two sees itself, which is what this little, why it's bolded. The website doesn't draw self loops. It like puts a little ring around it. Um, and zero also sees one. So this tells us what worlds you can get to from any world that you're starting in. And you might imagine that phi is necessary if in all the worlds I see, phi must be true, right? So we might want to say that zero models box P because P is necessary from zero. And you can see that because all the worlds that zero sees, namely two and one model P. And notice it doesn't matter that zero itself doesn't think that P is true. Um, this is the kind of thing that axiom T for instance would preclude. Um, and depending on who you are, you may or may not view this as a kind of pathology. But with one bonus axiom and it's a bonus axiom that we will include, um, you can get rid of this uh, potential pathology. And similarly, if phi is true in some world that I see, then it stands to reason that we should imagine phi as being possible. Um, so zero, rather interestingly, thinks that Q is possible and that not Q is possible because two thinks that Q is true and one thinks that not Q is true. So uh, historically, so there was some interest in modal logic as a way of sort of coding up intuitionistic logic um, because you get uh, things like this. And notice, one doesn't see anybody. One has no outgoing arrows. So one thinks that box bottom um, vacuously. Uh, this isn't going to be relevant in this talk, but it is something useful to keep in mind. OK, so we have some idea of what these things should mean. Let's actually go ahead and write it down formally. The definition doesn't matter too much, but it's exactly what you think it is. Uh, we know what it's defined. We know what worlds think that primitive propositions are true. A world should think a conjunction is true exactly when it thinks each of the conjuncts is true. A world should think a negation of something is true exactly if it's in the complement of the worlds that think the, the thing being negated is true. So a world thinks not phi is true exactly when phi is false. Um, and the interesting one is we interpret box by saying all of the worlds that I can see, so all of the W ticks that are related to me, think that phi is true. And all other connectives can be defined in terms of these guys uh, in the standard way using De Morgan's laws and stuff. But for concreteness, we'll write down uh, the interpretation of diamond as well. And diamond says that there exists some W tick related to me. So I can see some possible world in which, uh, in which uh, phi is true. OK, so once we have this, we then know how to define uh, the notion of uh, whatever it's called, uh, I guess, modeling. Well, OK, well, anyways, we, we can define this. Uh, we can define this double turn style, which says that a world thinks that phi is true. Or if we want to be really concrete, that at a, my model at this world thinks that phi is true precisely when what we were saying before. W is in the world to think that phi is true, which is a bit tautologous, but it's worth saying. OK, so why do we care about this? Propositional modal logic like, is really good at balancing simplicity against utility. Right, where it's expressive enough to model a lot of real world scenarios. 
Um, it's used all the time in computer science, and it really is used like in the real world to model propositional systems. Um, and so even though it's really useful in the sense that it models lots of things, it's still simple in the sense that it's robustly decidable. And basically any change you want to make to modal logic is going to keep this decidability property, which means that real world algorithms can actually like, uh, so I say here, the logic is decidable, it emits model checking. There's lots of really nice features which are like actually concretely implementable and run relatively quickly in practice, even though the worst bounds are abysmal. Um, and this makes it really useful in applications, for instance, for proving that programs do what you want them to do. Uh, even in industry, this is used uh, like by real software engineers. So not even application to other branches of mathematics, like real applications. But I, I can't help but wonder, right? Like, what about function symbols? What about all these other things that we typically think about as logicians, or I guess as model theorists, more precisely? Um, doesn't it seem restrictive to only work propositionally? You know, it feels like, yeah, this is powerful enough to do a lot of things that uh, we care about in practice, but it feels like we should be able to say more. It feels like we're, we're sort of losing out on some power. Well, we're, let, let's put a pin in that um, and talk about something seemingly entirely unrelated. Uh, okay, so pre-sheaf categories. We're gonna say C is my favorite small category and we're gonna talk about the pre-sheaf category over C. So it has lots of structure. Indeed, it's a topos, no matter how little structure C started with, which is incredibly useful because structure in a category, remember, corresponds to what kinds of logical statements it can interpret. So the fact that uh, set to the C is sort of maximally structured means that we can interpret any kind of logic we want to interpret inside of it. Following Mackay and Ray's, uh, we can do first order and indeed higher order logics inside it. So let's see a simple example of this in action. So say C is my category A, A, B with one arrow F and a group in set to the C is a pair of groups G, A and G, B plus a distinguished group palm between them. And in general, a model of some, some theory T is, so, so you can see this is a picture of C in a certain sense. And the picture is made entirely of groups and group homomorphisms. Uh, that is, a, uh, a model of some theory in set to the C is exactly a functor from C to regular old set value models. You can chase through some definitions, uh, and it's a little bit annoying. The, the better way to do this is to spend a little bit of time getting abstraction up front and look through the lens of Levere's functorial semantics. And in that case, um, models are just functors. And since it doesn't matter how you curry the functor, this theorem becomes pretty much immediate. Um, and so you should think about a model in set C as being a regular model that is sort of changing with time, right? So I said we were gonna talk about this later, where for instance, if you have, if C is the natural numbers viewed as a poset, then we, we have a chain of models and you can think about um, you, you can think about a, the truth value at some model as being the, this model changing in time and its opinion on various uh, logical questions changes. Um, this feels modal, doesn't it? Um, so uh, before we move on, uh, quick, quick caveat lecture. So what we're about to talk about is something that I developed independently. It is almost certainly been done by somebody else, but I haven't been able to find it anywhere. So I'm sure lots of people in this room are going to have references for this. And I would love to hear about it because I also haven't finished, I, I haven't chased through a lot of details for this. Um, this is just a thought that I had while I was writing this talk. Um, so <clears throat> it's entirely possible that I'm about to lie to you. That said, I would be very surprised if I'm about to lie to you. There's a, uh, there's a notion of, uh, first order modal logic, which was done by uh, Audi and Kishida uh, a little while ago. And that is very similar to what I'm about to do. So uh, I, I, if nothing else, morally what I'm about to say is right, but I haven't chased through the details. I don't actually have a soundness and completeness proof, for instance. But, um, ow, ooh, it, it's that pin we placed earlier. Okay. So why, remember, we, we put a pin in first order semantics for modal logic. 
then I claim set C provides a natural setting for interpreting these guys. So if C is a frame, which we're going to view as a category, then set C provides a natural semantics for first order modal logic, right? Uh, a model in set C is exactly a family of classical models parameterized by our frame. And we know how, we know how to interpret the first order fragments at any particular world. Um, then the modal operators give us some way of seeing what nearby models think um, just by sort of pushing our modal operator uh, lo looking around the frame. I'm going to give an example in a moment. So, oh, let's see an example. So consider this group living in sets to the, I, I don't know how to name this category, but set to the this category. So we have a free group in the middle and we have, I guess, also a free group, but really the integers on either side then we know how to make sense of what, for instance, AB thinks of a given modal formula. So AB sees each of these two worlds, and each of these two worlds is abelian. The group living in that world is abelian. So it is necessary that abelian is holds, even though AB itself is not abelian. Similarly, AB thinks that for all x, it's possible that x is a square. And that's because in this possible world, if we push any, any guy, x was probably a bad letter because x is this guy here. But if I pick some group element in AB and I push it along this arrow and I move into this world, then I do have a square root. And so uh, just sort of from this example, it should be kind of clear what is meant by the semantics of this interpretation, even though um, I haven't had the free time to really make it precise yet. So. Again, because that was a little bit wishy-washy, um, I'll tell you something that's definitely been studied before. And that way I'm guaranteed to say at least one thing that isn't false. But if, if anyone has seen this kind of idea before, I'm sure someone else has done it. It's too natural to not have been done. I would love to hear about it after the talk. Um, so instead of working with pre-sheaf models, you, you may remember that pre-sheafs and etal spaces are sort of the same thing, where an etal space you think about sort of having glued all of the fibers of my sheaf together then it turns out there is a logical interpretation in this sense by Audi and Kishida, which I referenced earlier. And the idea is I look at my base space and I pick some Atal space sitting on top of it. And each fiber of this Atal space is going to be a T model. And I'm going to, in sort of the same way that I was doing earlier, each, each fiber then I can interpret my theory. And we say that P models the first order fragment of the theory exactly when the fiber sitting on top of it models that theory. And as for the modal operators, well, in Audi and Kishida's framework, we actually have a topological structure on this. Um, so yeah, uh, we can, I didn't talk about uh, topological semantics in modal logic, but there's, there's a way to do modal logic in particular S4 uh, topologically. And so we say that P models box phi exactly when some open neighborhood around P living in my base space, every point of my base space thinks that phi is true. So again, this is some model of, of necessity, sort of everywhere around me thinks that phi is true. And there's almost certainly a way to make sense of what I was thinking in terms of this uh, framework, either by saying the word Alexandrov topology like three times in front of a mirror, or there, the, the connection between sheaves and etal spaces is too tight for us to not be studying the same thing with different language. And so again, if someone can tell me if someone's thought about this, I, I would love to hear about it. Um, okay, so that's sort of the end of the first half of this talk. Do people have questions about anything we've done so far? I'll give people a second. This is a good pause. If, if I lost you at any point, now is maybe a good time to check back in. I would love to hear if people have questions about things. If not, we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, let's move on then. So we've seen how categories help us study modal logic. Can we use modal logic to help us study categories? And the answer is a resounding yes, and this is an extremely active area of research. But we need to take a moment to talk about type theories, which is something that, again, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with, but we'll go through it just in case. The idea is to associate to each category C a programming language, T sub C, and it has a type for each object of C, and it has a term of type B with a variable in A for each arrow from A to B living inside of C. And the reason that we care about this is because sort of 
nice properties of my programming language or operations that I can do to my types correspond very, very closely with structure on my category. So for instance, if my category has products that corresponds, not, it doesn't sound like I'm saying much, but that corresponds to my type theory having product types. If my category is Cartesian closed, I have function types. Again, it doesn't sound like I'm saying much. Uh, one that we don't typically phrase as a programming language, but we're, we're really doing the same thing, is that if my category has regular structure, then I have a good notion of subtype that admits existential quantification and uh, conjunction on subtypes. And indeed, if I have a topos, then I have access to the entirety of first order logic, power set types, sort of everything that you might want to interpret inside my category, I can. So, uh, Chris, this is this is just like the the type theory associated with a category, right? Like how homotopy type theory is associated with uh, an infinity one topos. Yes, exactly. So okay. what I'm really outlining is I'm outlining what's called the internal logic of some category. And you're totally right. Uh, homotopy type theory is the internal logic of some of some large uh, infinite category um, or infinity one category. So. Um, Okay, so sort of analogously to, if you remember, oftentimes if you're interested in studying like some linear map, right? A good way to go about studying your linear map is to look at the f of x module. So you look at a module over polynomials where the, the f structure, f is my field, that gives me the vector space structure. And I interpret x as acting by my linear transformation. And so, in some sense, this is giving us some syntactic way in terms of polynomials to reason about my favorite linear transformation. And this gives us some amount of control over the linear transformation. For instance, this gives us sort of for free the rational uh, canonical form as well as the Jordan canonical form. And so it, by analogy, you might want to study a category equipped with some distinguished monad um, and so or co-monad. What kind of constructor should we add to our language in order to have access to this co-monad? And again, I led with the vector space analogy, but this is something that people really do care about in practice. So there's a paper of Mogi from 1991, which actually uses this. And this, this kind of semantics is exactly how, for instance, the Haskell programming language works. Um, and so we want to talk about, with my favorite monad, adding some syntax to talk about my monad. Well, what even is a monad? That's a good place to start. And so I want to, for the first time in my life, say that a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors and not mean it snarkily. Uh, this is actually an audience which would uh, appreciate that. But uh, somewhat more pedestrianly, a monad is a functor from C to C equipped with these two natural transformations. We have a way to get from the unit natural transformation to M, and we have a way of sort of squishing M down satisfying certain natural coherence conditions that I didn't feel like teching, frankly. Um, and a co-monad is exactly the opposite. So you flip the arrows, you do exactly what you expect. So let's expand out the definitions because these aren't necessarily enlightening from a type theoretic perspective and see if we see anything uh, interesting. Well, for each type A, a monad gives us some eta from A to monad of A and some mu from this guy from MM of A to MA. If we suggestively write diamond for M, then you see that these are exactly the axioms for S4 from earlier, where this guy here is axiom T in terms of diamond, and this guy here is axiom four in terms of diamond. And dually, a co-monad gives us these terms, and this corresponds to an S4 system on my type system where my co-monad is playing the role of box. Well, what about K, right? Uh, we have T, we have S4, but K is like, the most important axiom that your modality has to satisfy. And unfortunately, it's a little bit tricky. So to even talk about an arrow from M of A to B, uh, we already need Cartesian closed structure on C. That way we can talk about applying a monad to some function space. That's what Cartesian closedness buys us. And regrettably, even though morally M satisfies this condition because it's a functor, there's no reason that this sort of external condition that we living from the outside can tell that M is a functor should internalize to a map on function spaces like this, um, which is tragic. And there's a couple of ways around this. The sort of naive approach is to restrict attention to monads which commute with products. 
And it's not hard to check that if you do this and then you, uh, you basically just apply a jointness to this, you, you hit the valuation map with M and then you wiggle around with this thing. It turns out you can, you can get a term of this type. Um, following Mogi, like I said earlier, it's enough to look at strong monads so you can relax this slightly in order to get just an arrow from A by NB to M of A by B. And that is nice, but it turns out to have some, uh, it has some issues associated with it. I, I should, I put that bullet point up too soon. This has some issues associated with it. Uh, most notably, the, the type theory that you get from it, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have computational or proof theoretic content, right? The, the, the Curry-Howard correspondence doesn't work as nicely as you would like. Um, and that said, it's still good enough for a lot of practical purposes. And I believe this is what uh, Haskell is based on. Um, it's also a fantastic paper. If you're looking for like a really good read, it's, it's really, really good. Um, but OK, uh, Kobayashi actually solved this sort of uh, uh, may, made this a little bit better at the cost of some complexity. And Kobayashi studied what are called L strong monads, which is a more technical condition that again, I didn't feel like teching, but it turns out um, it sort of solves all of these problems. Uh, Kobayashi's L strong monads give us a good connection between what's called constructive S4 and this type theory. So you actually get, uh, for instance, soundness and completeness and a nice uh, semantics for a type theory which has these modal operators, where the modalities are again interpreted, interpreted by some L strong monad. And the L strong monads turn out to be a more general class, which is the right thing to look at. And so realizing we're running low on time, we could just ignore this problem, <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't do that to you. So I'll, as sort of the last thing I say, I'll talk about what the type theory associated to CS4 looks like. Um, and then if you want more details and if you want to really know what these L strong monads are, again, Kobayashi's paper is extremely legible. So it's, it's a good read. So first of all, it should have all the theorems of intuitionistic propositional logic. It should have modus ponens. It should have some axiom K um, but I need to explicitly include axioms for K box and K diamond. And um, this isn't a typo. This is actually box A to B implies diamond A to diamond B. And that's maybe something that's worth uh, thinking about uh, in your free time. We also have axiom T, where again, we have to specify T for box and T for diamond separately. And we also have axiom four, where we have uh, T for box and, or four for box and four for diamond separately. And then you also need bottom elimination, which explicitly says that I can, uh, from, from the possibility of false, I can drive anything. Uh, and then I get necessitation for box as another rule of inference. Uh, as usual, we define not A to be A implies bottom. This is sort of the standard thing to do in an intuitionistic setting. And duality fails without uh, double negation elimination or a lot of the excluded middle. And perhaps unsurprisingly, this means the duality between box and diamond fails as well. So we have to formally include both of them as symbols. And we also have to formally include these dualized axioms. Um, and again, the idea is to interpret diamond, uh, diamond as some monad and box as some co-monad, which is associated to it. And Kobayashi goes on to construct the syntax for a type theory corresponding to this. And he proves that this type theory is sound and complete with respect to these semantics. Um, and this is far from the last word on intersection of uh, modal logic and type theory. And people right now are using modalities to add really high powered features from differential geometry into homotopy type theory, which I am regrettably underqualified to talk about, which is why I chose not to. Um, but the direction that I think is most exciting in this vein is the use of uh, modalities to interface between higher inductive types, which is how we typically talk about S1 and these topological spaces as some combinatorial homotopy theoretic notion, as well as the classical topological definitions uh, like x squared plus y squared equals one modeling S1. So this, this gives us, for instance, there's no satisfactory way to really talk about Brouwer's fixed point theorem, for instance, inside of homotopy type theory. And this gives us a way of using higher inductive type knowledge about S1 to gain information about uh, sort of classical topological spaces in a really, really cool way. 
And cohesive homotopy type theory is the word to Google if you're interested in that. All right, so that's, uh, that's what I've got. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to listen to them. I think that should have been about a half hour, which is what I was gunning for. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Questions, comments? Yeah, threats. So you mentioned like temporal uh, modalities at one point, mm -hmm. like where, you know, something changes after some, some time. Do you, do you handle that by having like, uh, a, maybe not a continuum of different modalities, but do you have some kind of like one associated to different times or is there, or is the kind of temporality built into the, the modality itself? Yeah, totally. So the, the sort of simplest approach is to only have one modality for a box, which will only tell you whether or not uh, something happens at some point in the future or whether or not something happens and then keeps happening, right? So it doesn't tell you when it happens, it just tells you that it does. Um, that said, you can totally add, for instance, uh, a different modality associated to, like you can add, if you have the natural numbers as a poset, then you can add a different modality for each natural number, which will tell you sort of exactly when a thing happens. Uh, you don't necessarily oh need to do that because for instance, if I write diamond, diamond, diamond box fee, then that tells me that's three time steps in the future, right? Uh, so something happens. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, and of course, that depends on whether or not. Yeah, it, it depends a lot on exactly what poset you're looking at. But the, like, the, like, like at some point in the future, you will be able to conclude that at some point in the future, something may happen. Exactly. And you have kind of nested. Okay, that's it, this gives you some amount of control over exactly what. Yeah. Um, okay, that that, that, that tracks. Uh -huh. Awesome. Um, yeah. Other questions about things. So I would have two comments, um, or maybe also questions that maybe it just um, depending on if I understood correctly. So maybe you can confirm that I under interpreted you correctly. Um, so you said that models in pre-sheaf categories are pre-sheaves of models. Mm -hmm. And so this is certainly true for algebraic theories, but for first order, you have to be a bit careful, I think. For example, if you get negation, then because the complement of a sub pre sheaf is not a sub pre sheaf on anymore. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, um, and then there's so you went all the way up to S four, but there's also S five. <laughs> there is the, the the amp goes up to eleven. Yeah. And S five is very relevant for what you're doing, I think, because. Um, so if you have a, a frame which satisfies S5, then this means precisely that it's a pre-order, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And Kripke showed that you can embed intuitionistic logic into S5 by uh, encoding intuitionistic implications somehow by adding modalities. I don't know exactly how, but mm -hmm. What that amounts to is um, so unwinding this encoding gives precisely um, model the model of intuitionistic logic in the category of pre sheaves over uh, over the pre order that is given by the frame. So. Um, and so then you can ask what happens if, if I want to talk about more general pre sheaves, which are not uh, um, over pre orders, but over categories. And then it gets a bit more complicated because then. Um, uh, so certain things are not just properties anymore would become, mm -hmm. you need additional data. But so this can be understood in, in terms of 
then you can think about introducing Khan extensions. And actually, Colin was maybe maybe Colin, you should you should be calling, talking about this because, um, yeah, Colin was also working on similar things. Um, so uh, yeah. sorry, I actually I actually missed. Um, well, I'm echoing here. Um, why did Khan Khan extensions? About your own talk. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, can I just correct you? The Interpretation of intuitionistic logic is into classical S4, and it's due to Gödel. It's not S5. It's S4. But it's S4 the one that corresponds to pre-orders or S5? S5. S4, S4 corresponds to uh, S4 is complete for like, topological models. It's hiding algebras or frames on Boolean algebras. And maybe we are both right. Is that possible? Well, S S five S four must be transitive and reflexive, right? So S four is preorderness. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Then, then I'm wrong. Yeah. And it's um, you have complete, even for first order logic, uh, completeness of first order logic with respect to for S four modal logic with respect to pre-sheaves on a category or pre-sheaves on a post set. Yeah, so this is, we could say historically, this is where uh, the logic of pre-sheaved categories comes from. 